I'm going to give you the first few points of your bulletin for those who were not here last week. We talked about God and the temptation tree, the temptation tree that's in your life, whatever that temptation tree is. Um, but I'm just going to give you the first, um, uh, first fill-in so those who weren't here can get those filled in and have that if you want it. Some people are OCD that way. They want all their blanks filled in. And so we will give, the, give you that this morning. Uh, then I also want you to open up. I didn't put the scriptures up on the screen because we're, I'm going to share a lot of scripture this morning. Uh, it, not in a whole lot of places, but a lot of scripture because I want us to get the full picture of what I want to talk about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, um, I'd like you to go ahead and open up to Deuteronomy. We're going to look at Deuteronomy and then jo- Joshua and Judges. So they're, they're, the books are right in line. So you can go to Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges, and you can hold your finger into those uh, areas, and then I'll tell you when we get there so we can follow along today so you can get the full gist of what I'm trying to talk about today, about God's design for us and God's design in, to have a relationship with us and with um, his people. So uh, just uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. We'll be looking at those today. Excuse me. So let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all you're going to do. I pray, God, that you'll just be with us, that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your word today. I pray, Lord God, that you'll just uh, um, convict our hearts. I pray, Lord Jesus, that if we look at this nation that is falling apart, then I pray, Lord Jesus, that, that we would be able to be the light shining in the darkness, and we'd be able to show Christ to, to those in need. We would be able to show joy when there's a time of, of, of despair. And I pray, Lord God, that we would be able to um, be on fire for you. We pray for a revival in your house. We pray for revival in your land. We pray for revival in the hearts of your people, Lord Jesus, that we be revived. I think we've been sleeping way too long, God. And I pray, God, that we would wake up there would be a great awakening, Lord God, in your word, that in the hearts of your people that would just be going out and that we would be able to show that no matter, no matter how hard it gets, no matter how many laws can be, can be made to, 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 um, so, so we can't distribute your word, that we stand firm in your word anyway because you are the word, you are the hope, you are the life that we look for. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ, we pray, Lord God, that we would be able to communicate this. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we talked about time uh, a, a while back. We talked about God and time. And then we talked about uh, the temptation tree uh, in your life last week. Let me give you a few, the first few fill-ins here for your, uh, for your bulletins, just so you have those. Uh, I talked about Genesis chapter 1. A, you know, God created the heavens and the earth and everything that was in them. Uh, and then I also showed you that the, the Lord, uh, again, in, uh, in Isaiah, that he... Uh, uh, is is responsible? He's he's the one that made everything. I mean, if you just want to prove God, just look outside. I went outside for a walk this morning. Um, I took an extra few minutes before I came to church, uh, and it was just too beautiful. The dew was still on the grass. You could hear the birds singing. The door was open, and um, I just grabbed a a cup of coffee and I just walked around the the property a little bit and just was praying and looking at all the beauty that God created. The sunrise, and and just I love to. Hear, isn't it great to wake up the birds singing? It just it's just a happy sound. It's just it just puts joy in your heart, you know, when you hear it. And how can you not look around and go, "Wow, this is amazing!" What God created. This is amazing stuff. And it was just so peaceful and joyful this morning. And so God created everything that there was. So when you first fill in, before there was anything, before there was anything, there was nothing. In other words, God created something from nothing, which is only a thing God can do. And I talked about how science uh, is invalid to explain God. Because in order to explain something, you need to observe it, right? Right? We can observe God. We can observe God's love for us because he gave his son. We can observe the things that Christ did. But who can explain how God can take something or take nothing and create something? Only he can do that. That's not something science will, be ever, will ever be able to explain. And therefore, so we, I was telling you last week that there, there's no science 
that can explain who God is, what he's done, and what he continues to do. He is the sustainer of life. So therefore, science is invalid when it comes to explaining God. And I gave some examples of that. And then I said that God created. He created all the creatures of the sea. He created the, the creatures that, that, that roam on the land. And then he put man and woman right there in the garden. Remember I shared with you last week, he, he, he said, you know what? You can, you can have anything you want in this garden. Here's the garden for you. Uh, and you can eat every herb. Everything that I've created is right there for you. You don't need anything. But he put that one temptation tree right in the middle of the garden and says, you can have anything, but don't eat that. And so, I, you know, in, in our life, we, you know, God says, you know, you can have anything, but I just don't want you to, just don't indulge in this. Just don't indulge in that. For if you do, you will surely die. And so they had all these things what else more could they want? They walked with God in the garden. In fact, it says in Genesis 1, 29 through 30, it says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. Also, to every beast of the earth and every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on on the ground in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. You see, they had everything that they could have wanted. Anything they need. But they wanted to grab from the one thing that they couldn't have. And that's the way it is in our life. We, have, we, don't, we don't really need anything. We have everything we really need. But, but we think we need this and we need that. Or we want this and want that. And then we fall into sin because we want to go after the one thing in our life that we should not pursue, the one thing in life we should not go after. We have everything we need. But we want the one thing that is forbidden, the forbidden fruit of our life, that temptation tree. And that's the one thing that we will go after. And then when we go after it, we realize what our eyes are open. We already know sin, so I'm using this as kind of a metaphorically here, okay? But, you know, when we go after that one thing... We know we're not supposed to. We know we shouldn't indulge in it. We know that it could destroy us, but we do it anyway. And then we come to the point and go, wow, now I'm really sorry I did that because look at all the consequences and all the stuff that's falling down around me because I went after that one temptation tree in my life that I knew that I should not pursue, but I went after it anyway. And then guess what? We fall. We find ourselves ashamed and naked, which is how Adam and Eve found themselves. And that's where I want to pick it up. In Genesis 3, 6 through 8, it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, now men, do not goad your wife, okay? Yes, she ate first, but it wasn't until both of them did it that they sinned, okay? <laughs> but she saw that it was good for food. And it was pleasant for the eyes. And that's how much of, of life's uh, sinful things, it's pleasant to the heart. It's, it's something we want. And a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband and with her, uh, with her and he ate. And then here it goes. It goes, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Who told them that? And they knew that they didn't have any clothes on. And so immediately they went around, and it says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. You see, their eyes were open. They didn't even know they were naked in the garden. But it was when sin entered, they became ashamed. And not only were they trying to cover themselves in their nakedness, they were trying to cover the sin and the, sh and, and the shame of their sin in their own heart. And they were trying to hide from God. For it goes on to say, And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed big leaves together, and made for themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They were walking with God. And he goes, Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, where are you? And Adam and his wife, 
hid themselves from the, uh, from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. They hid themselves from God. Somebody whom they walked with. Because their eyes were open, they took of the one tree they shouldn't have taken from, and now they were ashamed and naked. They made clothes for themselves, and they hid from the one who wanted the relationship with them the most. And all they had to do was stay away from the one tree. And remember I said last, last week, I said, you know, why would God put that tree there to begin with? Because without sacrifice, there is no love. Without deciding that, no, I won't take from that, and I'm going to follow this over here, we cannot demonstrate our love for God. If we want to demonstrate our love for God, we deny the temptation tree in our life, and we go after God, and we go, God, you are the one that I want to pursue in my life. Therefore, I am going to be a living sacrifice, and the things that are desirable to the flesh, I'm leaving over here, and I'm going to pursue God with all my heart, soul, and mind. And when we do that, then we begin to please God. And we're pleasing to him. And guess what? We can start to have a clear conscience again. But we'll never have a clear conscience if we're not seeking to please God first and putting him first in our life. So in Adam and Eve's case, everything they had known, the peace, prosperity, the unity, even their relationship with God, it changed that day. They realized that they were naked, they became ashamed, they hid themselves from God, and the world itself also became a cursed place and became corrupt. And ever since humanity, we have been running from God. You know the difference today, though, than when they first sinned in the garden? In the garden, they hid themselves from God because they were ashamed of their sin. You know what the difference today is? We're proud of it. We don't hide our sin anymore. And it's in your face, God. I'm going to live any way that I want to, Lord. And, and you know what? I'm, I'm proud to display my sin for everybody to see. We're not even ashamed of it anymore. We've become so corrupt in a society. So we put it on, display, and we even invite others to participate along with us. And not only that, we write laws to make people participate along with it. How far we have come. How did we get here? Think about it. How in the world did we get to the place where we're at today? I was talking with somebody this morning, I think it was John. I was talking with him out there, and I said, look, you know, isn't it amazing how corrupt this world is, but um, has the world really changed all that much? I mean, you go back and you look at Israel and you look at the sins of, uh, and, and all the warnings and, and, and the signs that, that God says, you know, obey my command, serve after me, and I will heal your land, and, and I will bless you. But we always turn our back on God. Is it really much different today? I don't know. But this I can tell you is that the reason we are here in the predicament that we're in today is because we have totally denied God in our life. We didn't want God in our schools. We didn't want God in our homes. We didn't want God, you know, in our courtrooms. I'm amazed, I'm still amazed, that we still put our hand on the Bible in the courtroom. I pray we never take that away. I heard just again, uh, uh, I don't know how true this is. Um, I I was kind of, well, let me just stick to this one. I I, I shared this a few weeks ago. You know, California right now is in the the process of, of making the Bible illegal to sell. And you know how they're doing it? They passed the law, and they passed the... Good luck trying to enforce it. But they passed the law saying, you know what? Anything that preaches or anything that is against LGBT, anything that is against the way one person wants to live their lifestyle, I mean, you, you can't have any book out there that says the lifestyle you live is wrong. And therefore, if it says, and if it doesn't agree with anybody's lifestyle, you can no longer sell it. And that bans the Bible. Because the Bible is about what pleases God. And it's about right and wrong. And if we come to the point where the Bible is illegal, and it's already happening in, the, in this country, that's amazing. Then watch out, because God will abandon the nation And the nation will take the penalty of itself and God's wrath upon itself. And they're going to go, 
what happened? I thought God was a loving God. He is a loving God, so much so that he sent his son to die for us. But he is also a God of righteousness. Remember last week I was saying, if he's the one who created everything, if he's the one who created us and put us here on the earth, then wouldn't he be the one that says, hey, if you want to be pleasing to me, here's how you live your life. I created you. I want you to have a relationship with you, but I don't, I don't like this sin. I don't like that sin. If you want to, so God is the one who has the right, being he is the creator, to, to say what is right and what is wrong if we want to please him. But we want to please ourselves now. We're all self-righteous. We don't care about God anymore. We don't want God in our life. So how do we get there? It's because we're not following the practice of teaching our children and our children's children. We're supposed to teach them diligently about the ways of the Lord. And so God says, you know what? As, as Israel's wandering through the wilderness there, you know, he delivers them out of Egypt. And, and Moses is there, and he leads them around. And he goes, eventually, as a promise that he gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob's names turned to Israel. And he says, you know, I'm going to send you, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to let you, I'm going to carry you over into a land that is very prosperous. And I'm going to give you homes you didn't build. I'm going to give you wells you didn't dig. I'm going to give you vineyards you didn't plant. And it's all going to be for you. But be careful, because if you don't teach your children where all this came from, they will begin to forget where it came from, and they will begin to forget me. And when they begin to forget me, they will go into their sinful way and just be displeasing to me, and then my righteousness and my judgment will have to come down upon the sin. And it's up to us to teach them. God doesn't want us to live um, unprosperable. He got, you know, God actually wants us to prosper. In Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a hope and a future. A future and a hope. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to be fruitful. But how do we prosper and live in a hope and the security that God intends for us to live? It's in Jeremiah 29, 12 to 13. It's right after this. He says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. When's God going to listen? When we pray. When's God going to hear us? When we're on our knees. When's God going to prosper us? When we submit to him. You want to prosper? You want to have a happy life? You want to have a happy home? Commit your life to Christ. Live it his way. Do it his way, and you will prosper. It goes on to say, Pray to me, and I will listen, and you will seek me and find me, and when you search for me, with all your heart. We need to do it with all our heart, not just in bad times, but all the times. And I think this is in your bulletin. You will prosper when you seek God with all your heart, soul, and mind. You will prosper when you seek God with all your heart, soul, and mind. With all of our being, with everything we have, when we don't forget God. If we forget God, His judgment comes upon us. And we are warned in Scripture time and time again what will happen if we don't remember God and we don't teach them to our children. We see the results of it happening all around us right now, of disobedience. The Bible says that God will move in your life when you submit to him. You know, in the Bible, a lot of times they would go around and they would, um, when, whenever God wanted them to remember him, and so they could teach their children, he'd say, you know, I want you to build a pillar. I want you to pile up some rocks. I want you to do this. Uh, but I, and he goes, and, and I don't want you to teach these things to your children so you don't forget. So when they pass by, they go, well, what is that there for? And they can remember and they can tell the story of what God did for them. So they would erect monuments, pile up rocks, build a pillar. And we, so they would be reminded of the past. So they wouldn't forget God. So they could live in the present and press on to the future with him. To remember the future. In fact, in Joshua 4, 
Okay, if you're in Joshua, turn to Joshua chapter 4, 1 through 7. Joshua 4, 1 through 7, it says, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now remember, a whole generation had to die out before they could run in, go into, uh, in, into, uh, into the promised land. Remember Moses, he could see it from a distance, but he wouldn't cross over to the promised land. Now it's Joshua's turn to take them into the promised land. And here's one, one is that says in verse 2, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right where the priest stood, and to carry them over with you and put them down at a place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, of the Israelites. To serve, now listen to this, to serve as a sign among you, and in the future, when your children ask you, What do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the ark. This is another miracle, by the way. Uh, before the ark of the covenant in the, um, of the Lord, and when, uh, and when it crossed uh, the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. He says, I want you to remember what I'm doing here. I'm stopping the water. It says the water flowed up. There. I don't know what flooded up there upstream, but they crossed over on dry land. The God of miracles. And you know, right here in the United States of America, we have erected monuments and sayings to remind us of our past so we won't repeat the things of our past to help us live a more prosperous life in the present, leaving something behind for our children in the future so we won't forget our roots. But today, we are doing everything we can to erase our past in the United States of America. We have taken down the Ten Commandments from our courtrooms and from our schools. We're removing the statues because they're too offensive instead of remembering where we came from. We are erasing everything from our past because we don't want them to remember, which is the same thing God says, you better remember me and you better take me with you. We dishonor our flag, we disrespect our soldiers, and we blaspheme God right to his face by the sins that we commit. And if we continue on this path, in this land, we will become so corrupt and so disobedient to God that we, he will no longer hold back his wrath and judgment upon our nation, and we need to take heed of this today and put God back in America again. Otherwise, we will lose everything. We will. Because we'll be so disobedient and so corrupt, we won't even remember the Lord our God who brought us to the land that we're living in today. And it will be our fault. Because we're not teaching them. We're taking down the statues. Oh, Robert E. Lee and these are, they're too offensive. Why don't we use that as a teaching tool then? And teach them, why is it offensive? Well, it has to do with slavery and it has to do with this. Okay, tell them why slavery was wrong. Don't take it down and forget the past. Remember it and teach them as, a, as we've erected these, these monuments. As a remembrance of what has happened in this land. So God tells the Israelites, don't forget me, don't leave me behind, because I am giving you a land that you didn't work for, and that's what's happened in our generations behind us. I am giving you all these things. I was talking to my neighbor not too long ago, a neighbor right down the road, and uh, we were just talking, we crossed him into in Walmart of all places, and... Um, he was going, you know, we were just talking about getting older and, and just retiring because he'd been retired for, for a long time and went back to work and things. And, and uh, 
um, he likes his, uh, doing his farming. He's got a couple farm tractors and, and cattle and stuff that he loves to do as a hobby and makes a little money on the side doing that kind of thing. And, and uh, he says, uh, we got, got into retirement or somehow talking about the future and stuff. And he goes, well, I just tell my kids, um, you know, when I die, all the stuff becomes yours. What did they do to work for it? I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying an inheritance is a bad thing. But when we hand it down and hand it down and hand it down and hand it down and they haven't worked for a thing in their life, what do you think they're going to do when they raise up? They think everything should just be handed to them. And we're going to hand it to them and we're going to hand it to them. And then all of a sudden they're going to look to the government and they're looking for the government to bail them out. That's not what we should be doing. Life isn't just this big rosy thing of, of, of being handed down this and handed down that because he's what he's saying to, to the Israelites. He says, you know what? I'm taking you to a land of milk and honey. I'm going to give you all of this stuff. And when you get this, be careful because if you don't teach these things, this pile of rocks, if you don't tell them what this is all about, they're going to forget me and I will have no other choice but to exercise my wrath and judgment upon them. And do we want God's wrath and judgment upon our children? I would hope not. But if that happens, guess who's to blame? Those who went before them. Because we didn't remember the Lord our God and teach it to our children. In Deuteronomy 6, you got there, hopefully you got your thumb there. Deuteronomy 6, 10 through 12. So it shall be, says... When the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities, you did not build. Houses full of all good things, which you did not fill. Hewn out walls, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. And when you have eaten, and when you are full... Then beware, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, because you're going to go right back into it. He says, don't forget me, because I'm giving you all this stuff. So in your bulletin it says, don't forget where your blessings come from. If you're working and you got a good job, guess who, where that blessing comes from? God. He gave you the ability to do it. If you abandon him, he will abandon you. And when we are abandoned by God, and when we come under his judgment, we will have no one to blame but ourselves. And we're looking up and going, what in the world happened? It's because we are not teaching our children that this place that we live in doesn't come for free. It comes for free with a sacrifice. Deuteronomy 6, 13 through 25 goes on. It says, You shall fear the Lord your God and serve Him, and you shall uh, take oaths in His name. You shall not go after other gods. And we do that, the God of money, the God of stuff, the God of the people who are around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous, uh, jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him at Mesa. You shall diligently keep the commands of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes, which he has commanded you. And you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, and it may, uh, that it may be well with you, that you may go and possess the good land of which the Lord swore to your fathers. He's keeping his promise to cast out all your enemies from before you, as the Lord has spoken. When your sons ask you in time, come, saying, what is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, the judgment which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, this is us teaching them, then you will say to your son, We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed us signs and wonders before our eyes. 
great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and his household. Then he brought us out from there, and he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God. Now they're teaching their kids here, right? For our God always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteous for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he commanded us. You see, we need to teach our kids and we need to teach our children the statutes of God if we want to be a blessed nation. Well, the Israelites prospered for a while. They remembered God for a while. Then Joshua came to, comes to the end of his life at 110 years old and in Judges we see that Joshua dies. And the godly generation that God prospered begins to fade, and they begin to turn their back on the Lord. Look at Joshua 2, 8 through 20. Then Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. And they buried him in the land of the inheritance of Timoth, heirs, in the hill country of Ephraim north of Mount Gash. After the whole generation had, now listen to this, after the whole generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. A whole generation came up. He says, he's telling right here in Joshua, don't forget, teach your children, make sure they understand and now we're seeing right here in Judges that a whole new generation just grows up and they forgot the Lord their God. And listen what it goes on here. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals, forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods. What do we worship in this country? <coughs> Excuse me. For the people around them, they provoked the Lord to... Um, they provoked the Lord to anger because they forsook him and served Baal of the Asherah. And his anger against Israel, uh, Israel, the Lord handed them over to the raiders to be plundered by them. He sold them to their enemies all around them. And it goes on here and it tells you exactly what happened to them. If we in this country ever deny God that much, it is not far to where this land will be plundered and taken over. Because the anger of the Lord will rage so much in this country or any country for that matter when you forget the Lord your God. We need to get back on our knees again and we need to give our life to Jesus Christ. We need to start teaching God again. We need to start getting God um, in, in our country again. And we need to start making America one nation under God again if we want to be a blessed nation. And if we don't do that, and if we continue to allow states like California to continue to do the things that they're doing to outlaw the Bible, and we're going to say, okay, we don't want to teach our children the Ten Commandments. We don't want to teach our children the Bible. We think it's harmful. If they learn it, they might, be able to, they might start to follow it. And we believe that that is harmful. So we're going to write laws and say, no, you cannot teach any of these things to your children. Then we're in the first stages of denying the Lord our God, and it won't be long before that when the God's wrath will come down upon a nation that has turned his back on him. It won't be long. And then we're going to be sitting there, and our children are going to be sitting here going, well, what happened? Well, what happened was we didn't teach you the statutes of the Lord, and so therefore you forgot the Lord, and you began to do evil in the sight of the Lord, and because God is a righteous God, he has to punish unrighteousness, and therefore your sin is going to be punished, and therefore there's going to be consequences for your sin. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my children to be eternally separated from God. So where do we go from here? I'm going to tell you that next week. How do we get it back? It starts by prayer and getting on our knees in repentance. And start following the Bible and what God tells us to do to teach our children the statutes of the Lord.